Uh, good evening once again and welcome and uh, we trust that you will experience a blessing as we uh, continue with our presentation and uh, this evening I will be sharing two presentations in one uh, if we get through both I don't want to keep you too long uh, but I'd like to share very briefly the um, first one is just relating to uh, the history of the Sabbath school and why we struggle to have uh, enough members. The second one is uh, the Spirit of Prophecy and uh, the Sabbath School. So let's get started. Uh, as we do so, uh, we have already prayed. I just want to quickly reflect on the date today. I see this and other memes going around all day, 22 October 1844 and 22 October 2024. And uh, 180 years since the great disappointment of 22 October 1844, as part of the um, prophecy of Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14. And I often reflect on this, and we, we kind of wear this as a badge of honor. And in fact, it is an indictment on the church that 180 years after uh, the great disappointment, we're still here. It's not something to be proud of, it's something to reflect upon, but to reflect upon in terms of the way forward and how we can make sure that it's not another 180 years but i truly believe with all my heart as a preacher of the gospel that it will be our generation that will see jesus come to the clouds of heaven and i pray that as we reflect on this this evening that we will be ready on on that wonderful day and so bringing the mission back into the sabbath school um Pastor Jim spoke at length about this, and I believe uh, Pastor Ebenezer will also share this. But I'd like to share it from a different perspective this evening. Why do members miss Sabbath school? Why do members miss Sabbath school? Well, firstly, why should we attend Sabbath school? And I believe one of the most important reasons is found in the biblical injunction of Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, which says, and let us consider one another in order to and stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So here uh, Paul writes to the Hebrews, and he says, don't skip Sabbath school. <laughs> that's a paraphrase, of course, but that's what uh, this verse boils down to. And it's interesting that he says the closer we get to the second coming, even more so, um, while it seems that the trend is exactly the opposite, that there are many people who uh, would rather not go to Sabbath school as time continues. And so we ask the question, what percentage of members, <coughs> apologies, what percentage of members come to Sabbath school? If you were to compare a church, let's use it as a percentage of 100 members, and 80 is in attendance in uh, the divine service, what percentage comes to Sabbath school? Well, recent findings show that Sabbath school attendance has dropped from 80% of church membership to 40% of church membership in the past 30 years. So in one generation, we've halved our Sabbath school membership. Um, now, I might hasten to add that uh, although the condition of every church may differ, uh, so this is uh, in some areas less, in some more, this is on average, it remains a real challenge to bring attendance as high as church membership. And so the question uh, we need to ask is, why do people not come to Sabbath school? And I ask this question on many occasions uh, as part of training and as I reflect on this. And, and people basically have three answers to this. Uh, excuse me one moment. I just want to uh, get rid of this. Apologies for the... There. So people generally have uh, three answers. The first is the commitment of the members. And we know that according to Revelation chapter 3, uh, we are referred to as Laodicean. Now, we often want to apply the Laodicean lukewarmness to people of other churches and other denominations. And yet, I believe God is speaking to us as well. And uh, the challenge is that in the 
seventh letter to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 3. God is pictured standing knocking at the door. And while he is knocking at the door, we often want to apply this uh, metaphorically to the door of our hearts. But the prophecy refers to the seven churches. So he is knocking on the church's door. I think uh, the doors of our hearts is a good secondary application. But primarily it has to do with the seven churches and the seventh one time period we are. So why am I mentioning this? Well, the difficult part of this um, Laodicean church is that if God is knocking on the door of the church, where is he? He's outside. He wants to come in. He wants to be part of what we're doing. But sadly, we have excluded him and we are running church and doing, uh, you know, being very busy in our spiritual lives, but without the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't like this image at all. It's a bit disconcerting. But uh, if you think that I'm busy preaching heresy, it is confirmed in Matthew chapter 25 with the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, as you know, a virgin representative of God's church. And here in the parable of the ten virgins, there were five that were wise and five that were foolish. We find that um, how many fell asleep? It was not five. It was ten. So here's a second picture of God's church and his members at the end of time, which are asleep. The first one is running church without uh, without God. And and both of these I don't like. It really causes me to feel you know, a little uneasy. And I pray that everyone on the Zoom will not be in that category. <laughs> but yet it is one of the contributing factors why church, or rather Sabbath school attendance, has dropped. Now, this has become worse during the onset of COVID because during the time of COVID in most areas, people's churches were closed and a lot of ministries went online with wonderful results. Even today, some of them uh, are still leading many people to God. There's a, a, a thought of digitization, which people didn't previously have. And it's making life easy. But it also has a drawback in that People now can sit at home and select one of 10 or 12 different churches, their favorite speaker. They can sit comfortably at home. They don't have to dress up for church <laughs> and sit in their pajamas. And um, they don't need to be at church. So this is the drawback of the digital age that we're in and the fourth digital revolution and specifically the uh, consequence of covid and many members have, after church, after COVID, uh, not returned to church because of the ease which um, digital technology has brought about. And so must, we must be aware that uh, this is a challenge. I uh, don't know what the solution to this is always because those ministries are legitimate ministries reaching a lot of people, people that are shut in people overseas that are in the diaspora or expats, a lot of people which otherwise would not have been able to hear the message. So um, the intention is not to get rid of that ministry because it's serving a very good purpose, but just to realize that we should bring it to the attention of our members that um, sitting at home for the Sabbath school is not the same as uh, coming to church. There's a uh, the loss of the second of the three um, initiatives, uh, the one of fellowship. One can do Bible study and prayer at home. Uh, one can even do mission at home, but one cannot fellowship when you're alone at home. And so doing Sabbath school at home is not really Sabbath school. It's a um, way in which we have lost uh, the benefits. So the commitment of the members is uh, is a challenge at times, and... Um, we, uh, I think, will address that a little further at a later stage. The second is the quality of the Sabbath school program, which I guess is linked to the commitment of the teachers. And uh, and as I say, this feedback uh, is what I constantly get from people when I ask this question. So the quality of the program could be a challenge. And uh, many of you have attended a Sabbath school which went something like this. And I might be overdoing it a bit, but uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this morning's Sabbath school. 
I had a very, very busy week and uh, I didn't really have time to prepare, but I'd like to read a few chapters from a wonderful book and then the person <laughs> picks up the book and <laughs> starts reading. And uh, we all smile as we uh, hear that because we've all experienced that uh, at some time in our life. And so I think the challenge is how do we make sure that the quality of our programs that include Sabbath school as well as the lesson study is of the highest quality? Well, firstly, there's a distinction in people's minds, unfortunately, that the Sabbath school is of lesser value than the divine service. Just the names we give to the services um, indicate that. So we'll have the Sabbath school and the divine service. The one is only Sabbath school. The other one is divine. So God is present there. And, and I'm saying this a bit facetiously, but even the way where we place the Sabbath school versus the um, divine service, uh, the speaker uh, speaks of this. So the Sabbath school is normally up close near the people but a little lower where the divine service is just a little higher up on a platform almost as if you're a little nearer to heaven and a little closer to god <laughs> now we know that's not true but but it does create that perception in people's minds that the one is of lesser importance and uh, even just by the placement of the sabbath school as well as the divine service one can negate uh, this challenge so the quality of the Sabbath school program is of vital importance, and it takes a lot of time to prepare a good Sabbath school. My first mentor when I entered the ministry, actually my second mentor, um, was a pastor who insisted that every week I do at least 20 hours of sermon preparation before I was allowed to preach. And on a Monday morning during our admin committee, he would look at my preparation he would go through it and he would determine how much hours i have done and if i am ready to preach and mostly i was ready but now and again he would look at my preparation and he'd say ah, you've only done 13 hours sorry you're not preaching on sabbath and and 20 hours sounds harsh especially for a full-time pastor who has to do it every week and uh, but the church members can differentiate if you have had 20 hours of preparation versus 20 minutes Within one minute of your presentation, they will know immediately, have you prepared or not? And if you have not, they're going to shut down. They're not going to listen as well um, to what you're saying. So I'd like to add this to something very simple. We have our uh, mission reading. Nowadays, uh, in many churches, they use the mission DVD. And uh, even the mission reading we give to someone and we ask them, please read sometimes a young person or a new member to get them comfortable with the way church do things, does things. And so the same thing happens. I'm giving you an example again. Person picks up the mission book and starts reading, looking down at the book throughout. Then they get to those long, difficult names of the people in Southeast Asia or wherever it may be, and they're struggling to pronounce this and and no one's listening because you've lost your audience. So just as an example of the quality of the program and good preparation, have a roster and give the Sabbath school less, uh, uh, missions talk a week ahead of time to whoever's going to prepare it or, or present it. Ask them to prepare by reading it through three times a day. It takes about two minutes, morning, afternoon, evening, for six days before the Sabbath. That gives 18 readings. By the time one has read the story, remember it's only a story, 18, maybe 20 times, anyone can retell that story. Having eye contact with the audience, not um, struggling with the names. And, and if you struggle with the names, change it. Change it to something easy. If you forget something, the people won't know. But, but make sure that you put some creativity and innovation into this portion of the Sabbath school program. And uh, I, I mentioned this um, as an example. I think it includes the um, Sabbath school as well, the lesson study. Um, everything needs to be well prepared. Uh, getting back to the mission reading, one can even have some of the uh, church members participate in a small skit where they dress up maybe in the traditional clothes of the country. And if there's a story, as an example, of 
someone who went to an Adventist school, the mother and father sent the child there. Then you have a church member, a family, a mother and a father, and they take the daughter to someone who's representative of the school. And it, it just leaves an impression because when one sees things, we think visually. And when we see this, we will remember it and, and we'll, we'll listen and the people are participating. So um, just one example, but uh, you know, one can think of others as well where the preparation time is of vital importance. Now, the function of the Sabbath school, we'll get to that later, and the lesson study and the divine service differs. Sadly, in many churches, we have three divine services. <laughs> so we have one at 9.30 when uh, the Sabbath school time is there. And I've heard excellent services there, but that's not the reason or the function of the Sabbath school. Then we have a monologue even at... Um, uh, 10 o'clock when people are supposed to be interactive in the Bible study. And uh, it's interesting, I've heard people preach an entire sermon during the uh, Bible study. And uh, then finally you have the divine service at 11 o'clock. So uh, one reason people don't come, no one uh, signed up for three divine services. <laughs> we would rather like uh, some differentiation, some... Uh, excitement in the way we present things, and we lose the function of the Bible study as well as the Sabbath school. So the next question is, what is that function? And we'll get to that now. But uh, just as we wind down on the quality of the program, um, the most important thing in the preparation of the program is, of course, the time which one spends in prayer. And... Uh, Often we do not do this. So make sure that whatever you do is uh, filled with prayer, is uh, a prayer-filled presentation so that you are speaking what God wants the people to hear. And often I've had experiences where I've preached the sermon or shared something, and I've really felt oh, this, was, this was not a good presentation. And then people will come back and say to me, that really touched my heart today. Uh, someone is busy drawing on the screen. One second. Let me just, uh, I don't know how that's happening. I just want to reshare you. Um, so maybe we can just, uh, okay, I think we're back again. The writing should be gone. There we are. So, uh, yes, if you can make sure that um, the quality of the programs are top class, it will make a difference. Now, the one challenge is when we speak to people about poor attendance, we normally address this during the Sabbath school. And now we preach into the choir because the people of who are in attendance at the Sabbath school are not the ones who need to hear this. They're already there. How do we reach the target audience, which is the balance of the people which only attend the divine service? There's a few ways one can do this. The first is um, during divine service to have a short two-minute powerful testimony of what the Sabbath school meant to me and um, get people excited and they also want to be a part of this the second is from time to time maybe once a year to swap the order of divine service and sabbath school um, and when people come at 9 30 they are there for a service after the service is the lesson study and then 11 o'clock we have our sabbath school program and uh, then do a top quality program so that people say man i'm missing out i'm not going to uh, miss this again <laughs> So various ways to make sure you address the right people at the right uh, place um, by doing good quality programs. The third reason, um, uh, I put a question mark there, people uh, forget about this because it's probably the most important. We'll get back to that one now. Now, a lot of these things we can solve on our own, obviously through prayer, but it's not rocket science. It's not difficult things and difficult challenges. But it's the third one which I believe is the most important reason why within a generation we've halved our Sabbath school attendance. And uh, I believe if we can get this third one sorted out, we will be uh, a lot more effective. And that is the, the mission, bringing the mission back into the Sabbath school. And Pastor Jim spoke very eloquently last night about this, and I uh, see the next presentation will also touch on this. Is our Sabbath school mission focused? So, uh, in most Sabbath schools, the 30-minute slot, uh, what 
time is allocated to mission. If we must be honest, it is maybe the two to five minutes of the mission talk um, or the mission uh, video. And uh, the rest is not really focused on mission. And maybe this is where the challenge is. Um, so in order to understand this, I want us to, uh, maybe someone can just mute there. I hear some background noise. Thank you. In order to understand this, I want us to go back to the history of the uh, Sabbath school and mission in the church. And as I understand it, the Sabbath school was originally created for one purpose only, and that is for mission. And uh, in the early years of the church's growth, it focused just on mission. So that was the opportunity where people could make calls for people to enter the mission field. That was the time where people would uh, get feedback from the missionaries in the mission field from right. all over the world. And the, it was launched from a base in yeah. California. But this isn't another... Thank you. Um, I was listening to the... Okay, so uh, that is where they would get feedback from the um, missionaries in the mission field and not like today where it was quick information on the internet. Uh, it would be letters that would have been written. People would read the letters. They would um, pray for the missionaries. It was a very spiritual moment. Um, it was also the time where there would be funds raised for mission work and the mission outreach. And uh, I grew up, and most of us, with 13th Sabbath offering, which was not just a incidental offering. Uh, nowadays, 13th Sabbath is when you come to Sabbath on the 13th, uh, or church on the 13th Sabbath, you see what's in your pocket or in your wallet, and that is what you contribute. Uh, I remember having specific projects, especially children, um, and miracles where God blessed these projects, and that money would then, after 13 weeks of this project, maybe planting a crop or maybe buying and selling something or you know, some creative ways getting funds and sending that for the mission work there. So uh, even, even that has been lost in the last generation. I, I see in some areas it is still prevalent, but mostly 13th Sabbath is just, you know, whatever, whatever change I have in my pocket, and that was not the intention. So the Sabbath school started out with a very, very strong mission drive. And I think in part this contributed to the growth of the church. So I might want to now just uh, deviate for a second before we get back. Many times people have asked me the question, why is Sabbath school and personal ministries put together? Because they don't really belong together. And just the fact that people ask this question is maybe, again, an indictment on the way we are running Sabbath school. Because people see Sabbath school as uh, 9.30 to uh, 10.45, a sermon and a lesson study. Uh, and evangelism is something completely different. But maybe there's a lot more in common if one considers the initial uh, way in which Sabbath school was run. And so it contributed to the growth of the church in a very large way. And the church grew and expanded, and every five years with the general conference session, one would see how we have entered a few more countries and a few more countries, and the church was expanding, and it's, it's wonderful. And then suddenly, about a generation ago, we reached a point where we had reached nearly every country on earth. I think there's 14 countries that we have not entered yet. And probably this side of eternity, we will not enter them. <laughs> um, some of these countries are countries such as the Vatican. I don't see uh, a Seventh-day Adventist church in the Vatican soon. <laughs> and some of the difficult areas such as uh, North Korea, Djibouti, Eritrea, etc. And um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but for the last, let's say, 30 years, it stagnated in terms of growth within countries. So uh, there's no maybe one country every 10 years or so that we enter. Now, I might also hasten to add that we are in a lot of these countries through the wonderful marvel of modern technology. And a lot of these countries, the church is um, run underground. So it's not that there's nothing happening there, but officially uh, the church is not uh, there. 
But uh, I think what happened then is because of this, uh, within territories, so choose any country within South Africa, there's still a big um, amount of growth which is needed because uh, there's a lot of unentered people groups, according to the Joshua Project. There's a lot of unentered areas, unreached people um, in South Africa. So there's still a lot of work to do, but 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 we started looking at the mission in terms of the expansion worldwide, and we came to a point where uh, that stagnated. We'd reached every country which was easy accessible. The last ones we are still struggling with now, and maybe that was one of the reasons, one of the contributing factors why we started to deviate from our mission. Because we looked back and we said, We've accomplished this. <laughs> Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, we've reached nearly the entire world. And we look at the greater picture. Uh, I recently understand from the uh, secretariat, the world church has just hit 22 million members. And we look at that and we say, praise the Lord, 22 million members. That is, that is wonderful. And yes, it is. But what about the 2.8 billion people in the 1040 window, which has never heard about Jesus? What about all the unentered areas? But but somehow the accomplishment of reaching the entire world caused us to deviate away from the core mission value of the Sabbath school. And, and we then, within a generation or two, uh, started to just share wonderful, beautiful uh, messages, but we lost the mission drive. And so if you want to revitalize your Sabbath school like never before, bring the mission back into the Sabbath school. I was so grateful to hear last night, uh, Pastor Jim, and some of the contributions, how people will be uh, using the Sabbath school time, not only to speak about mission, but also to do mission, to, to use the time slot from, say, 8 a.m. to uh, uh, 10 a.m. and go out and do mission. We must not only be speaking about it. This must be the vehicle which we do mission with as well, getting a project within our community, getting people excited, raising funds for a project, and then going out even during the Sabbath school time and doing something which will get people excited. And you know what? Um, the most exciting part of a pastor's ministry and work is when you see people making decisions for Christ. Um, there is no money in the world that can buy that. It is just one of the most wonderful, beautiful experiences that gets pastors going and members alike. And, mm -hmm. and so when you can involve the members with that, they are going to get so excited that they are going to say, I don't want to miss Sabbath school. I want to be part of this traction within the church of reaching people for Jesus, of making a difference. Of, And we lost that excitement. In most congregations and churches I visit, um, it's lost. It's gone. And it is not an easy thing to revitalize. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of prayer. But if you want to change the Sabbath school, don't only focus on the uh, commitment of the members, the quality of the program, but bring the mission back into the Sabbath school. And so uh, I would like to just again mention uh, the I Will Go initiative. I understand that the most recent uh, council at the general conference this has been revoted for the next five years as the slogan and i believe there's power in this uh, especially as we bring this into the sabbath school because uh, it is personal it is not the pastor who's going to go it's not the elders it's them to them too <coughs> but it is me it speaks to me and to to uh, me that needs to go and there's uh, uh, an immediate uh, urgency. I will go. Not I'm deciding. I'm thinking about this. I'm considering it. I will. And then the third word is a verb. And it's interesting how many times this word is used throughout the Old and New Testament. God calling people. He calls Abraham to go from his country into a foreign country in um, uh, Genesis 12. Genesis 22, he calls him to sacrifice his son. He says, go. Uh, he calls uh, Gideon to go and uh, deliver the Israelites from the Midianites. He calls Moses to go and deliver his people. He calls Isaiah to go. He calls um, Jonah to go. The 70 need to go. Everyone, this word is used over and over and over again 
uh, by God in the Bible as if uh, there's an injunction that we must keep going, we must keep moving. And then, of course, we find in Matthew chapter 28, the wonderful portion of Scripture, uh, the Great Commission, which also has this word in. And this is not only for Jesus' 11 disciples, uh, but it is for every one of his disciples. So, so, so encourage people using the slogan, especially because it's now been voted for a second time. I believe there's power in going, in, in making a decision to uh, follow Christ's example and go with the knowledge that as you go, God will be with you. Now, I just want to quickly reflect on total member involvement. And uh, obviously, this is one of the previous uh, slogans which we used. But even today, total member involvement is still relevant. It might not be the um, main uh, thrust, but the Sabbath school is there to involve as many members as possible. And uh, I will go as up, it's an upgrade to that. Um, it's expanded on that. But, but try to get as many of your members involved. Um, and so uh, for the second part, I'd like to segue into Ellen G. White and the foundations of Sabbath School Alive. And I do this um, with uh, considering what was mentioned, I think, by Bar Brother David Kuhn last night, the importance of the Sabbath School um, manual as well as councils to Sabbath School work. And I believe this is vitally important because often we want to reinvent the wheel. We look at the um, success of other churches and we say, how can we also be so successful? How can we have this wonderful growth? And, and yet we have a mountain of information which can make our Sabbath schools even more effective. Wonderful God-sent advice. And so... In the second part, I'm just going to again introduce you to some of the quotes as it relates to the three objectives. Just as we reflect upon this, um, and I want to encourage you, it was posted in the uh, chat last night. If you need it, we can repost it to go through the Sabbath School uh, handbook, Sabbath School manual. But if you are a Sabbath School superintendent, um, as well as the class teachers as well as the uh, other superintendents encourage your members to read councils to Sabbath school work at least annually if that is uh, your um, ministry make sure that you read it on an annual basis and and it will enthuse you it will help you to uh, be excited and give you ideas which are incredible it's not a thick book as was as was mentioned but it is a powerful testimony to how we must uh, run our Sabbath schools. And uh, as we consider some of these quotes, um, I would just like to add, they're not all from the Sabbath school, uh, councils to Sabbath school work, but I want to uh, briefly look at them as they relate to the Sabbath school alive um, program. So the first of these three is Bible study and prayer. And before I continue, I just want to make a quick summary again. It was mentioned last night. Uh, in the past, there were four, and mission was global as well as international, uh, as well as local mission, which have now been combined into one. So it's the same um, four uh, initiatives, which has now been changed into three. But uh, in terms of where we are, the Bible study and prayer is our strong point. There is no church on earth which has such a good, well-researched, biblical-founded Bible study program as found in our adult Bible study guides. Um, and, and I think this is our strong point. Uh, we can always do better, but uh, it's, we're really doing well there. Fellowship, uh, we're doing better, especially since the onset of the action units. And uh, it's very important that the Sabbath school uh, does well with fellowship, but I'll refer to that later. Our weak point is the mission, as was mentioned previously. And if we look at these three um, different parts of the Sabbath school, that is the one that we need to revive through a lot of reformation, revival, prayer. Um, that, that is where uh, I believe we, we need to grow. So let's start with some quotes on Bible study and prayer, then on fellowship, and then we'll close with some on mission. 
Uh, so firstly, Bible study and prayer. Um, when Jesus told them that he was to be put to death and to rise again, he was trying to draw them into conversation in regard to the great test of their faith. This is a wonderful way that Jesus used to reach out to people. Uh, and you'll find this with his interaction with Nicodemus, the woman at the well in uh, John 4 and elsewhere, where he would try to draw out discussion. And I think that is important when we consider our lesson study presentation, that like Jesus, we are not there to preach a sermon. Ask a few poignant questions, and then you draw out the discussion. But regarding the great test of the faith, regarding salvation, and someone asked the question last night, how do you deal with people who hijack lesson study for their own uh, ideas? Uh, I think it was answered very well, but... Um, Always come back. Make sure that in every presentation, Sabbath school or lesson study, people make a decision. It can be a small decision, but that they grow in their faith. The next uh, quote is from councils and Sabbath school work. It is not the best plan for the teachers to do all the talking. Hmm. But they should draw out the class to tell what they know. Then let the teacher, with a few brief pointed remarks, illustrations, impress the lessons on their minds. And I believe this is again uh, important relating to the adult uh, lesson study that it is not a second sermon. It is there that we must get people to engage, get people to share. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, just pick up my thoughts again. Yes, the, the, the intention is not that the teacher do all the talking, uh, but that, again, they draw out the people to discussion and share the wisdom which they have. Uh, because obviously... Um, it is not only one person, it is uh, the entire group which is now contributing. So uh, Jesus' use of stories and illustrations from Christ's object lessons. Jesus sought an avenue to every heart. Their interest was aroused by figures drawn from the surroundings mm -hmm. of their daily life. And we know how often Jesus used parables, stories, illustrations. And obviously, uh, it must be functional. Often people find a wonderful story. And once they have the story, then they begin with the story and they build a Sabbath school program around that. <laughs> that is not the intention. It must be there to support a mission-driven uh, Sabbath school. But as people, we are visual and we think in visual terms. Um, and so as soon as we tell a story, people visualize that and they will remember the information based on that. So... Some of my earliest memories of sermons is the illustration. And from that illustration, I can tell you what the sermon was about. But sometimes within a month, I forget a sermon if there was no illustrations or stories. It's quite a um, difficult uh, thing to do because of uh, uh, the access to information today to find a unique story, something which... Uh, people will really be um, enamored by and that they will enjoy. But make sure that there's always at least one illustration following Jesus' method of simply telling stories. It doesn't have to be a, a story of something else. It can be a personal experience. Um, but uh, Jesus made use of this. Our next quote, also from Council's Sabbath School work, teachers in the Sabbath School have the missionary field given to them to teach uh, the scriptures, not parrot-like. Now, this one was, served, uh, was shared last night again, but I felt I want to repeat it again. To repeat over that which they have taken no pains to understand. They are they which testify of me, the Redeemer in whom our hope of eternal life are centered. Um, interesting way in which it's described here yeah, that uh, it's we shouldn't just be regurgitating the information. And I've been in lesson studies where people literally read the entire lesson study book um, verbatim and one often uh, you know loses interest because it's it's not creative 
So uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Jim, for sharing that one last night. I just wanted to repeat it. Study, discover new truth, and then communicate it. If we would study the Bible diligently and prayerfully every day, we should every day see some beautiful truth in a new, clear, and forcible light. Now, this is a high calling to see something new every day. It doesn't mean it's a groundbreaking new revelation of truth, but, but just something more beautiful about Christ's character. And I reflect on another quote from Ellen White, where she says that throughout the ages of all eternity, we will be studying the character of God and never understand the fullness thereof. So even this side of eternity with uh, our minds corrupted by 6,000 years of sin, it is possible to, to just learn something else. But study the Bible with that intention to learn something about Jesus. Um, teacher is also a leader. Our superintendents, our teachers in the Sabbath school should be frequently in prayer. Remember, this is Bible study and prayer. The word spoken in due season may be as good seed in youthful minds and may result in leading little feet in the right path, but a wrong word may lead their feet in the path of ruin. Although this refers to children, I believe it can refer to superintendents and Sabbath school teachers in general as well. And we should be frequently in prayer. There should be as much time in prayer as there is in preparation. Now that again is a high calling. But if we do that, the quality of the presentation will be of such and the mission-centeredness of the presentation that uh, you know people would truly be uh, interested to, to hear. Um, the time spent in matters of minor importance should be spent in searching the scriptures, that you may know how to labor successfully in the work to which you are appointed. It means that you must become acquainted with the Spirit of God. It means that you must do much praying and have much serious thought as to how you may put to use every capability of your nature and carry forward the work of God effectively. What a high calling. What a beautiful quote. Uh, regarding the scriptures and and prayer. But this uh, teachable attitude is not only for those that you are ministering to, but for yourself as well. For she says in the search in the scriptures, you are not to endeavor to interpret the utterance so as to agree with your preconceived ideas. <clears throat> and again, I've been in Sabbath schools where when the superintendent or the um Sabbath school lesson study teacher stands up to speak, I know what's coming. <laughs> the person has something which is important to them and irrespective of the content of the lesson, the person will always guide it to that which is of importance to him. And so as uh, Pastor Jim mentioned last night, we are not asking what does the scripture say. We are bringing our own human and preconceived ideas in. <clears throat> and uh, very difficult to change this in some people's minds, but important if we want to keep the Sabbath school fresh and relevant. Uh, excuse me for one second. I'm just going to close the door behind me. Apologies for that. Points to note when preparing a lesson. Teachers should not be satisfied to take the product of researchers of other minds, but they should investigate truth for themselves. This is also a difficult one because the Sabbath school lesson in itself is the product of other people and people with uh, excellent knowledge and uh, you know good information. Uh, so even while we are just doing our Sabbath school, we are um, using the other people's minds. But I think she's also referring to uh, not only doing that, but using our own creativity and praying that God would inspire us to understand it, but specifically for the needs of the church. And uh, a, a great quote with a wonderful uh, quality. Present great themes. Those who stand before the people as teachers of truth are to grapple with great themes. Great themes referring to uh, salvation, second coming, Truth, um, maybe we can just mute there again, please. Thank you very much. There should be a living, growing interest in storing the minds with Bible truth, very much the same as the previous quote. The precious knowledge thus gained will build a barrier about the soul. So I hope you're starting to understand that the Sabbath school is there for the salvation of people. It is there to uh, proclaim the mission. 
uh, it is not only there to fill in a 30 minute or um, together with the lesson study, 75 minute uh, slot. Having a spirit of investigation among the pupils of the Sabbath school, there should always be a spirit of investigation. I like that quote. And so I'd like to move to uh, the second of the uh, three initiatives. I'm going to be giving this to you uh, for those who are interested to go through it. Um, you can use this as well. But uh, let's look at the uh, fellowship next. Uh, there are many more quotes that uh, will be a blessing to you, and uh, you are welcome to also use this in your presentations. So fellowship, as I said, maybe not uh, our strongest point, but we're doing a lot better than in the past. But very important because people's first impression of the Seventh-day Adventist church is often the Sabbath school. And first impressions last. Um, sometimes people attend the divine service first, but mostly they come to the Sabbath school. And as they enter the church and they sit, they are expectant, if they are visitors, of what they're going to hear. And the first impressions last. This includes uh, not only the presentation, but the way that they are treated from the door. Um, I'd like to share a short testimony, which I've heard this before, and I always thought it was anecdotal, uh, maybe an urban legend, until I heard it uh, firsthand for myself. When I was in the pastoral ministry, a lady uh, came to our church one day, and I went to visit her, and we started Bible study. She wanted to be baptized. She was an elderly uh, lady living on a uh, small stipend, and I saw when I went to visit her that I saw when I went to visit her that there were two other churches uh, nearer to her than the church where I was ministering. And so, as I got to know her, I suggested, um, for the sake of costs and convenience, you are welcome to worship by us. But do you know that there are two other churches? Yes, she says, I know, and I've been there. I said, pray tell. <laughs> And then she told me how she came to the Sabbath school for the first time. No one greeted her at the door, and she said she was okay with that. She sat down in the church, and um, you know what's coming. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Within two minutes, someone tapped her on the shoulder and said, um, excuse me, you're sitting on my seat. And uh, she stood up and found another seat, and you won't believe her testimony. I heard it first, and she said, Five minutes later, a second person came, tapped on the shoulder and said, excuse me, you're sitting on my seat. I, I feel so ashamed when I hear this. And uh, the second time she said, well, I'm just going to sit there. She just ignored the person and uh, the person went and sat on another seat. And, uh, and fortunately, the spirit of truth was so strong in her life that it didn't put her off from coming to church. And uh, she kept coming. And um, but she rather attended our church. She only attended that church once. In most people's uh, situations, they would have left and never came back again. Uh, but she did. And and I'm sad when I hear these type of testimonies of people not experiencing fellowship within the Sabbath school. Those first impressions, which start sometimes even in the parking lot, with the welcoming. Um, as they sit in church, the way they treat it. And this includes also the terminology we use. So um, we often use Adventist terminology without being um, trying to discriminate against other people, but which have no meaning to people. So we will say on a Sabbath, uh, welcome to our 13th Sabbath, and our 13th Sabbath offering goes to the North American Division. And, and people who are there for the first time are you know, what's this? They have no idea what we're speaking about. It's 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 foreign language. To us, it's very uh, well, we can understand it, but to them, it doesn't have any meaning. So especially if you see visitors, they tone down the language so that they can understand completely. Say, uh, welcome to our 13th Sabbath, Sabbath school program. Every 13th Sabbath, we as uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church unite to pray for and support a certain part of the mission all over the world. So, so now they have an idea. Explain it as to children, especially if you see these visitors. Because again, that first impression um, is important. People now feel they understand it's, it's not too foreign for them. Then the last thing I want to mention about fellowship before we read a few quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy 
is that when people join the Seventh-day Adventist church, generally it comes at quite a high cost. And people often sit and wonder, should we, should we not? Because the cost is, for example, the following. Many people will be forced to work on Sabbath and have to resign or lose their work. The families sometimes turn their back on them, even disowning them, wanting nothing to do with them. Their family, uh, not only their family, but their friends with whom they previously had partied and enjoyed life in, in, in that way, suddenly that's not part of their lifestyle and they turn their backs on them. And, and, and so they, they have the sacrifice of work, friends, family, other things. And, and on the other hand, they have the truth and the truth weighs heavier. And people are willing to make that sacrifice because they think of the millions of people through the dark Middle Ages which were willing to die for the truth. What does it matter? But, but it's still a big sacrifice. And so they come into the Seventh-day Adventist church with somewhat of an expectation that they will be compensated for the sacrifice that they made because now they're going to make new friends and everyone, you know, it's like being in heaven. Everyone is happy and smiling and it's just wonderful because the truth is so wonderful. So the people must be wonderful. And, and then sadly, sometimes it's not so. And we must remember the sacrifices that these people made. Some of us uh, did it ourselves. Um, uh, some are, you know, multi-generational Adventists, but others have made that sacrifice and so be sensitive that people have a social need within the church. And the sh Sabbath school is a good way that can address that, especially through the action units where uh, people will not just get lost and just be a number uh, in the church, especially in bigger churches. So um, fellowship, very important. A few quotes before we end with uh, mission. Um, I like this quote. Um, this is the secret of power over your pupils. Reflect him. Education, page 282. Mm -hmm. What a simple quote. And in its simplicity, how profound. So all we have to do is reflect Christ. And that includes in the fellowship and the way we uh, treat our um, Sabbath school members. If you are called to be a teacher in any branch of the work of God, you are called also to be a learner in the school of Christ. So um, there is a feedback loop in the Sabbath school and especially the lesson study, which we have in no other place. And uh, we must be sensitive to that. Um, it is not only to teach, but also to be taught. Now, as we uh, focus on fellowship more, we should set every agency at work that the school may become the noblest, most efficient school in the world. So the word uh, year school, Sabbath school, uh, we often forget that this is the intention, is to teach, but that it becomes practical in our spiritual growth. We must be able to help people to grow in their spirituality. And that does not only happen by uh, the transformation, uh, or, or rather the transference of information. It happens by interaction in a practical way where we fellowship with people. Uh, testimonies to the church, there should be family schools where every student will receive special help from his teachers as members of the family. They should receive help in the home. Tenderness, sympathy, unity, and love are to be cherished. So this refers to our church schools, but the same, I believe, is applicable to our Sabbath school, where we are now reaching out and addressing the needs of people. And here's the one challenge. It is a lot easier to share a sermonette than it is to Go and visit someone who is ill or counsel someone who has just lost a loved one. So we tend to move to the past of least, least resistance, which is um, in, uh, to just share information without sharing um, time with the people. I'm going to uh, read this quote. You will come close to them in loving sympathy, visiting them in their homes, learning the true condition by conversing with them, concerning their experience in the things of God, and you will bear them in the arms of your faith to the throne of the Father. You must win their affection if you would impress religious truth upon their hearts. Fundamentals of Christian education. And again, Sabbath school, one can gain a lot of insights from uh, the book Education, Fundamentals of Christian Education, which preempted that, and, and other books um, as it relates to, to a school. Love, the basis of creation and redemption is the basis of true 
education. And, and if you truly have a love for what you're doing, as well as for the people that you will be ministering to, uh, the effects will be uh, a lot greater. I like this quote as well, counsels to parents and teachers. Christ taught the truth because he was the truth. His own thoughts, his character, his life experience were embodied in his teaching. So with his servants. Those who teach the world must make it their own by personal experience. The teacher of truth can impart effectively only that which he himself knows by experience. And you only share what you know, but you share not only by information, but by fellowship, by spending time with people. Again, I'm not going to go through all these quotes uh, because of time, but I'd like to end with, as I mentioned earlier, the most important, that is the mission. And the mission consists of three different parts of mission. The first is global mission. The second is local mission. And the third is personal mission or personal ministry. And again, there's the link between personal ministry and Sabbath school. Global mission is, as we refer to it, their work might be called to do that, but it is generally other people's work from the perspective of the Sabbath school. It does not mean we are not involved in prayer, to support. It does not mean we're not involved through prayer and support and, and other things, but I believe that um, it, if God calls you to that, then do that too. So global mission, their work. Local mission, our work as a church. Uh, which is included in the Sabbath School uh, program, uh, most definitely. And then personal uh, ministry or personal mission is that which I do, my work. Their work, our work, my work. And sadly, we've focused more on their work in the past. And again, looked at the success of the church and said, ah, we're doing so well. And uh, one of the pastors here at the division says that as church, we often suffer from analysis paralysis <laughs> we're always looking at the figures and, and and the figures and looking how well we are doing based on that where there's more important ways to evaluate our success but that can blind us to the fact that what am i doing it is not about the greater church because if everyone just sits and looks at the greater church nothing will happen i am part of the contribution of the uh, in this case 22 million member success but don't be blinded by the success that we've had, because I believe that although God has blessed us up to this point, we are still falling further and further behind every day. And maybe the success that we have has become uh, what they refer to uh, as a resource curse, because we look at that and we, we're so impressed by our success and that we sit back and say, ah, we're there. We're not doing too bad where the mission is also, what am I doing? What am you doing? And I want to make this practical this evening, not only in terms of um, your Sabbath school work, but how many people have you led to Christ in the last year, two years, five years, ten years? How many people has your church led to Christ? And the truth is that do you have a goal? Because if you do not, you'll probably not accomplish anything. <laughs> But you must have a soul goal, like you have a financial goal, like you have a goal in terms of your education, the future of your children, whatever goals you have in life. If you do not have a soul goal, you're in trouble as individuals and as a church. And it can be one per year. It can be two, it can be five, it depends how many gifts God has given you. But zero is not an option. It's not an option. Every member must be involved in mission. The Sabbath school is the body which drives that forward. Thank you. So uh, as we wind down, let's read a few quotes from Ellen uh, White on the mission, and then we'll open up for some questions and answers. The Sabbath school is an important branch of the missionary work, not only because it gives to young and older knowledge of God's word, again, coming back to the Bible study and the prayer, but because it awakens in them a love for its sacred truths and a desire to study them for themselves. Above all, it teaches them to regulate their lives by its holy teaching. So here the Sabbath school is... Here the Sabbath school is used to encourage people and to make sure that um, they are growing in their mission work. You know this one well, the Sabbath school 
If rightly conducted, is one of God's great instrumentalities to bring souls to the knowledge of the truth. It's probably one of the best known quotes from councils, uh, the Sabbath school workers. And the truth is, if we were to evaluate your average Sabbath school based on this sentence, uh, we're not doing too well. <laughs> There's a lot of growth area that is needed. <laughs> Um, I want to read it again because it's it's vital. The Sabbath school, if rightly conducted, is one of God's great instrumentalities to bring souls to the knowledge of the truth. What is more missional than that? Um, again, from councils to Sabbath school workers, our Sabbath schools are not what the Lord would have them to be, for there is altogether too much dependence placed upon form and machinery, while the life-giving power of God is not manifested for the conversion of souls. For whom Christ has died. And this was written many years ago when it was a lot more mission driven than it is today. This order of things must be changed if our Sabbath schools meet the purpose for which they exist. Um, and I encourage you to change that. Sorry, I'm just going to get rid of this writing here. I don't know that's how that's happening. Um, one moment. Um, I believe we're back again. Apologies for that. Some, somehow there's some writing which comes on the screen. Moral transformation is needed. How sad it is to think of the great amount of mechanical work that is done in the Sabbath school. While there's little evidence that there's moral transformation in the souls of those who teach and those who are taught. Um, very much the same as the previous quote. It refers to the same. But, but the second part of this quote is quite sad. Very little moral transformation. And that is what mission work is about, moral transformation. If teachers in the Sabbath school felt the love which they should feel for those lambs of the flock, many more would be one to the fold of Christ. See a direct link to evangelism, to saving people uh, in this quote. Now, a beautiful promise, the Lord has made ample provision that teachers may have increased ability from Sabbath to Sabbath that they may teach to some purpose, working as for time and eternity. Uh, I believe that God also creates additional time when you are working for him. Um, and when you commit more time to his cause, you will have uh, more time uh, that he will open up for you by making life easier. I think this is what this quote refers to and making the road smooth for you. Um, the Lord calls for young men and women to gird themselves for lifelong earnest labor in the Sabbath school work. Spasmodic efforts will not avail to accomplish much good or to make you successful laborers in the work of God. Uh, it is not a random hit and run here and there. It is a commitment uh, to this wonderful ministry. Who will be earnest workers for souls? Our teachers need to be converted men and women who know what it means to wrestle with God. Who will be earnest workers for souls in our Sabbath schools? Who will accept these grave responsibilities and watch for souls that they must give an account? You see twice here, earnest workers for souls, earnest workers for souls, watch for souls. It, it is a lot more than just saying, uh, sharing a uh, short uh, sermon. It is missional. It is saving people's souls for eternity through the Sabbath school department. I think that will suffice for now. I've used about an hour. And uh, so I would like to open up for questions and answers. I'm just going to... Um, yes. Maybe we can uh, just close that again. Thank you very much. So uh, is there any questions? Uh, Brother David Kuhn again. Thank you very much. Hi, Pastor. Thank you so much for a beautiful presentation. Um, you spoke about, and last night there was also spoken about, action units. Um, this is a new phrase to me. Can you explain in layman terms what this action unit is, please? Thank you. No problem. Very good question. Um, so about 20 years ago, I believe, maybe longer, the church started with what they called action units, which is very much the same as a small cell group. So instead of having one big Sabbath school class, especially in bigger churches, uh, the church divides into a number of smaller classes. Um, there's a few advantages to this, um, and but there's also a difference between the cell group and the action unit, which I'll get to a little later. So some of the advantages to this uh, include the following. Um, firstly, 
there is a lot more participation because let's say you have a church with uh, um, 150 members and you have eight classes. There are now eight times as much participation, not only in terms just of pure figures, but also in terms of some people just do not have the, um, they, they're very shy and bashful and don't have the confidence to speak in front of 150 people where they do feel comfortable speaking in a group of uh, 8 to 12 or 15 people. So that's the first one. There's greater participation. The second advantage is that in an action unit, it can be a um, way to retain members. So in a big church, you come to Sabbath school uh, and next week you're not there and no one will really miss you because maybe there's 200 members. But if you're in a small action unit of, uh, let's say, again, 12 to 15 people, uh, you will be missed. And they will say, well, where is Brother David? Uh, no, he's, um, his child is maybe ill. Ah, let's go and visit his child and go and visit him and do a prayer for him. And uh, that next week you're there and you're visiting, you feel you belong. Whereas in a big church, if no one knows that you're not there for six weeks, some people just kind of, they forget. So it's good for membership retention. The third advantage is it's excellent for leadership growth. So again, one lesson study, one church, one teacher. Um eight lesson studies, one church, eight teachers. And people who might not be comfortable speaking in front of 150 people will be comfortable speaking in a small group. And uh, so a lot of advantages. Now, just very briefly, the, the distinction between a action unit and a cell group. A cell group has one function, and that is to give birth to another cell group. It's an organic um, way of church growth where it lasts for approximately a year and then it gives birth to one or two more and those continue and and that's the sole intention of a cell group where a action unit does not have that as the ultimate goal the goal is to make sure that the members have a comfortable space uh, where they can um, feel comfortable to share and where their leadership potential can be uh, can grow now, I just want to add one more thing about this, and that is that in an action unit, uh, the intention is that one doesn't start immediately with the lesson study, but spend some time just reflecting upon the week that has passed. And I've seen some places where they do it for, let's say, five minutes. How's your week been? Ah, oh, man, I had a terrible week. Uh, Monday was a blue Monday, and it was just terrible. And uh, Let's all pray for, you know, for Brother Mon. He's had a bad week. But... But the intention is not that this eat too much into your lesson study time, but but some time where there is fellowship and interaction and reflection, uh, where we support each other, where we pray for each other, short, very short and pointed, and make sure that uh, it um, it fulfills the fellowship mandate. So in short, that's what it's about. In smaller churches, um, this is a natural unit in any case. Uh, maybe you can divide it into two. Uh, but in very small churches, you already have that going. So then it's not necessary. And that's why some people don't know it. Thank you, uh, Brother David. Uh, Pastor Craig Baxter. Thank you, Pastor, uh, for your presentation. I just wish to hear your uh, opinion or if you have quotes on, I know some churches have got benches and so it ends up becoming a teacher-student approach of somebody up front and people in the pews, but which is better to have a teacher a student approach or to have a, a a small group circle approach? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Craig. I appreciate that. Personally, I prefer a circle approach uh, because then everyone is kind of on the same level. If you have a teacher in front, uh, you know, he's a little uh, removed and, um, people don't participate as much. So within a circle, everyone is looking at each other in a group uh, context where we're sitting in the pews. Um, you're looking at the heads of the people. You don't see their facial expressions. You don't read their body language. Uh, you hear what's happening, but you do lose a lot. Remember, 93% of communication is nonverbal. So you lose a lot of those nonverbal cues. Uh, so if possible, uh, and churches have uh, the facilities, loose chairs in a circle is the ideal. Uh, in some churches, that is not possible because of the way the church is built. And then one uh, makes use of what you have. 
Um, sometimes it is disruptive in a big church if you have three or four different uh, classes, um, maybe one in the front and one in the back, but one has to deal with that. Uh, the advantages uh, outweighs the disadvantages by far. So uh, small uh, circle is, in my opinion, the best. Thank you for the question. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Let me just quickly look in the chat. Um, Okay, there was a question that I'm quickly going to upload the um, Councils on Sabbath School work, uh, Sabbath School Handbook, and last night's um, presentation again. Uh, someone asked about that. Um, see if I can do that very briefly. Um, okay, there it is uploaded for those who asked. And I'm quickly going to upload also my presentation from this evening. Give me one second. Uh, um, okay, that's also uploaded now. So um, anything else? Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to hand back to uh, Pastor Nguenya. Okay, so in the chat, you have councils on Sabbath school uh, workers, the Sabbath school manual, last night's presentation from uh, Pastor Jim Howard, and this evening's presentation from myself. Okay, excellent. Pastor, uh, I don't see any further questions. Uh, back to you then. Thanks a million, my elder. Once again, the Lord has been so good. Uh, yesterday, we had a powerful evening. Again, this evening, God used you in a very special way. Um, I'm so excited to see so many people on the chart. It, 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 it conveys a powerful message that indeed Sabbath school still matters in our church. Um, one, one, one or two very much concerned. You, you hinted a bit on that one, um, my leader. Um, you know, I don't know how we can make every Sabbath school member present during the Sabbath school to be mindful of the visitors. You know, at times we just speak like, you know, it's just us um, alone and we can say anything. You know, there are people, there might be someone who is there for the first time just to observe so that they may make a decision to join or not to join. Then you open your mouth, um, then, then, then you just kill the interest one time and that person is never again to be seen. I'll make an example, Elder. Um, there were, some years ago, there used to be a, a lady from Germany. Can't remember her name. Uh, she, she was so much involved in prison ministry. She connected with me already from Germany. She had um, somehow won one or two souls right here in Deben. So she connected me, connected me with the people. So one day I went with her in, uh, into prison. And uh, when she left, I kept the connection with that particular inmate. Then, then this particular inmate was about to finish his sentence. At that time, there was something that they call it uh, weekend out so that the person who has been uh, in, in, in prison may have a weekend out just to inter interact with, with the outside world before, so that they know, because while they are behind, the world is moving. So, so that when they get out, it's not a big shock. So this person now were to attend Sabbath, Sabbath with me, where I was going to preach. You won't believe. There were two members, that uh, had uh, 
a challenge with each other. Man, they took up each other during the Sabbath school time. And uh, as a pastor, and I was from the conference, I decided, let me jump in and, uh, and, and take over the discussion and lead it to conclusion. I know my present, my contribution meant nothing. Can I tell you that that was the first and the last time that member visited? So all I'm trying to say, uh, we have alluded um, to the fact that Sabbath school is also designed for mission. P Pastor Jim also mentioned that. And you hit the same nail again. I'm, I'm just pleading that let us be mindful of people we don't know, not only the people we know, uh, let, let's be careful what we say. We might chase a soul away forever. Once again, uh, my leader, thank you for, for such a powerful uh, presentation and I hope my people have really enjoyed. Do you want to say something? Uh, very briefly, I see Pastor Craig Baxter's hand is up again, but before we do that, I just picked up two quick questions in the chat. Uh, Judith asked, can we change the norm of welcoming visitors during the divine service and during it during the Sabbath school? Most definitely, we can invite, uh, welcome them uh, in both. So I would definitely, definitely do that. So, And then there was a question from Reagan from Grootfontein Church. Good evening. Can a local church use their own 13th Sabbath offerings for local mission? Uh, that's a stewardship answer, but in short, no, that's a special mission for um, the 13th Sabbath offering. And we must remember that at times we have been beneficiaries of this. So uh, it kind of goes around. What comes around, comes around goes around. So quick answers to those two questions. Um, and then Pastor Baxter and back to you again, um, Fundis. Pastor, maybe there's not really an answer to this. Maybe it's more experiential and experimental. But... It is my opinion, or uh, whatever, that outside people do church for an hour. We do church all day. So how do we, how would you suggest bringing in youth? Do we bring them into the whole day? Do we bring them into a half a day? Do we bring them in slowly? Is there guidelines on this, or do we just keep moving until we win. Thank you, Pastor Monet. Uh, is that for me? Sorry, I thought it was addressed to Pastor Gwen. <laughs> uh, yes, it's a big challenge because if you're used to an hour and suddenly you come to these people and they're doing three and a half, uh, a lot of people it's just too much, um, or two and a half rather. And sometimes it's a full day. So what I do is I pre-warn people and I tell them uh, that it is going to be a bit longer than you used to, but give it a try. Most people are willing to give it a try uh, because maybe they're inquisitive, the, the truth has got all of them and they, you know, they're excited about that. So that's the first thing. Don't just uh, let people come expecting an hour and getting two and a half. The second thing is uh, mostly when people come to church on a Sabbath, they have already accepted the Sabbath. And as part of the challenge, uh, challenges around the change from Sabbath to Sunday, it is not only a change in terms of a cognitive um, change Saturday instead of Sunday. It is also how you keep Saturday instead of Sunday. Because uh, two generations back, Sunday was kept as a holy day. People had no commercial activities. Everything was closed. Now it's just another day. So people have a double mind shift to make. But in presenting, uh, you need to share with them kindly uh, that this is the way that God expects us to do it. And that takes time. But your question also related to the youth, Pastor Craig. And, and that's a problem because young people have a short attention span. Uh, the uh, millennials, gen Generation X, Y, and Z, and now they Generation Alpha. And from next year, we have Generation Beta. Uh, and each of them have different characteristics, but the postmodern mindset of these generations is quick. So if you put on a video clip and it's longer than 30 seconds, you lose them. Uh, my revelation 
presentation is 36 presentation of uh, one and a half hours each. I mean, it's it's just it's it's inconceivable to to their mindset. So so for the youth, one must keep it short and powerful. If if especially if you're in a university church or in a church with with young people, because uh, with especially cell phones and a lot of modern technology, they have lost their attention span. If 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 you don't get them within 30 seconds or a minute, you've lost them. And that is a challenge, challenge uh, wanting to keep them for two and a half hours. And as you said, that's, that's maybe more experiential, but, uh, but, but make sure, especially if you're in a youth environment, that you, um, you understand the way the young people think, the postmodern mindset, and that you address that. Because if we keep doing things, one day someone said, and this is a bit facetious, they said, um, we uh, sit on 16th century pews playing 17th century music on an 18th century instrument. And then we expect 21st century people to make a decision. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it's said a little in humor, but there is some truth to that, that we, we must adapt without compromising. Uh, and to find that balance, ish, that is difficult, Pastor Baxter, that's difficult. Thank you. Um, if that is all, again, Pastor Monet, thank you so much, my man. You are always a phone call away. Your support is much, much appreciated. I, I strongly believe that uh, by tomorrow, when we do the last presentation, everyone will be ready to do whatever we can to improve our Sabbath school, a program so that we can improve the attendance and so that we can focus on the main business of the church, which is mission. Thanks so much, my man. Tomorrow, we will have um, Pastor Epineza, uh, who is the associate, Daniel Epineza, who is the, the, the associate um, Sabbath School um, and Personal Ministries at the GC. So don't miss tomorrow. I was encouraged, um, Pastor Monet, that uh, as, 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 as early as six o'clock, people were starting logging in so that they are not locked out. That showed how much people appreciated, how much the commitment they have to the Sabbath school um, uh, 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 department and, and program. Once again, uh, Saints, may God bless you. Don't forget tomorrow, 6.30, log in, be early, uh, so that you are sure you are in. I will ask Pastor Siokeza to close with prayer. Please, Pastor Siokeza, who is the Sabbath School and Personal Ministry from the NCSA. Uh, Pastor, just before uh, Pastor, may we can just mute uh, uh, that one, please? Thank you very much. No, it's still not muted. Okay, just before we finalize, uh, I just want to mention uh, on the chat at 1947. I posted the link, the YouTube link from last night's presentation for those who might have missed. Uh, so you can go back there. Maybe uh, Sister Anita, whoever's running this now, yes, you're the host. Maybe you can just leave it open for uh, uh, two or three minutes for those who want to either download or just copy the link. But 1947 is the link from Pastor Jim from last night's presentation. Thank you. God bless. Are we, ready? Are we ready to pray now? Yes. If you want to say one or two things before you pray, you are free to do that. Or you just kill it one time. <laughs> okay, Mfundis. No, thank you so much, uh, brethren. I think I'm enjoying myself. Uh, uh, I can't wait for tomorrow to hear the last presentations. I think it's time for us to 
close, uh, I'm just going to ask Juanita to help many of us who may not be able to do what Pastor Monet was saying here, so that then we get these presentations. Let's pray, friends. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the training of the Sabbath school that has been organized for us as leaders in the church and in the conferences as the whole union. Father, we thank you so much for the training from yesterday and even today. We thank you for leaders like Pastor Monet who was able to give us another a powerful presentation to help us understand why is the Sabbath school important? And Father, to even know the history, why was it actually, uh, what was his, his purpose initially? And Father, thank you so much. We ask that you help us to pass on the information as people who attended to our various local churches so that the Sabbath school is revived. At this time, just before Christ comes back, may we be revived to focus on the mission of the church as a Sabbath school department. We also want to pray for the organizers of this meeting, uh, Pastor Nguenia the Union and his secretary. We thank you so much. And uh, may you pray. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless. See you tomorrow.